in Europe is quite striking because you have Finland, Finland with the highest, one of the, uh, the, the highest rates in, in terms of violence against women with highly educated women, economically empowered women, autonomous women, independent women, public policies in place. So honestly, I would like to know what's going on in Finland. For me, it's easier to understand what's going on in India because we have this, you know, patriarchal society, uh, some dynamics, etc. But what's going on in Finland? I think it's important to break down, you know, this, you know, dynamic or this rational, you know, this, I don't, yes, it's, it's a patriarchal rational again. So a, a universal agenda is, 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 you know, one of the main drivers of the new, uh, the new development agenda. And in that sense, I think that gives us you know, an opportunity to really break down some of the conceptual but, but also operational frameworks with which we have been working so far. Harmful practice, practices exist everywhere not only in the South. The second is, if poverty eradication is not going, uh, is not going to be the, the glue, you know, the, the consensus any longer, which is the consensus now? No? Which is the consensus countries, you know, are agreeing around? There is no consensus yet. That's why we are avoid, avoiding to speak about what we should be, should be speaking about, which, which, which is the essential, and we divert the conversation to the goals, to the indicators, to the targets. But let's say the most, uh, 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 the, the idea or the dimension that it's bringing countries together is precisely the dimension about inequalities. The need to put people at the center of the new development agenda. And to put people at the center of the new development agenda means to put inequalities, because inequalities don't happen only in the South again. Inequalities and growing inequalities are happening everywhere. We have been able to reduce poverty, but we have not been able to address inequalities, and inequalities, in fact, are increasing. And in that sense, I think in, in that context is where, you know, what we are discussing is particularly relevant. Because inequalities happen in a vertical and in a horizontal way. Amongst the individuals, amongst men and women, but also amongst population groups. And this new matrix, this conceptual and operational matrix that in a way brings together, you know, puts people at the center and puts inequalities at the center from, a, you know, bringing this vertical and horizontal perspective is probably, you know, a way to better understand why working with men and boys is particularly important. But not only because they are men and boys, it's because they are poor men, they are migrant, they are disabled, they are, you know, they, they, they face also, or they are indigenous, etc., etc. So, so I think uh, placing the, 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 the the, the discussion no? and, 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 and the, uh, our deliberations in a broader you know, uh, um, paradigm shift no? uh, around universality and around equality in a broader sense is, is particularly important. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for this grim reality check, actually. And uh, because there's hardly in time, we'll move on to the um, last speaker. Sharda Mulidharan um, is a joint uh, secretary at the moment in the government of India in Panchayati Raj. 
but she has been instrumental in um, associate with one of the largest women's scientific program in uh, state of Kerala, Pudum Sri, also involved as a director at the um, National Rural uh, Rivalry Mission. So we are fortunate to have two government, um, this is representing government here, Sarga P. I'm actually ready for it. Um, thank you. Uh, I must say that was uh, very powerful, uh, what we just heard. But um, I'm going to go very local. I come from the Ministry of Panjait Raj. And uh, the, what I would be talking about is primarily about um, my experience with uh, dealing with masculinity and um, in the context of the political empowerment of women at the grassroots level. Um, I just like to start with uh, with, a, with a small anecdote, something that I um, picked up when we were when I was working in NRL. We had, you know, we were talking about bringing women into the Gram Sabhas. Gram Sabhas are village forums, public forums where people uh, meet and discuss local issues. Um, so this was about SAG collectives telling them to go to go and be part. The Gram Sabha belongs to you, so go there. They went. So they got inspired by the training and uh, in a particular village in Maharashtra, they went to the Gram Panjayat and uh, participated. They went there during the day of the Gram Sabha. Um, the Panjayat was not expecting them. So they looked around, were very courteous, and very quietly shifted the Gram Sabha somewhere else so that the Gram Sabha could be held without women. Now this is the reality of space uh, which confronts women, um, especially in rural, um, in, in rural India. It's not seen, it's not talked about, but it's very real. The spaces are masculine. They are seen as places for men. They are not seen as places for women. We bring in women as Panjayat presidents but then we will have a Sarpanchpati, we will have a husband in tow who will occupy the seat and she will put her gungar down. So that's the space, again, even if constitutionally mandated spaces are given to women, that space is occupied by men. So how do you negotiate that? How do you get um, people to rework their, their idea of governance equity, of e equality within the governance systems? Um, to say that we will have a fair deal, that men and women will work side by side and uh, uh, fulfill their constitutional mandate for local governance. And that's where um, I'd like to talk about how we actually did work around these things and how some, and it, it's, it's been in Kudumbashri, uh, I'm, I'm sure most of you don't know Kudumbashri, it's an organization of uh, women's collectives, in um, SRG collectives, working with local governments in Kerala. And right now, it, um, 65 to 70% of all families in Kerala come inside Kurumbashri. So as a single organization, it is the biggest ever, bigger than any political, um, uh, political or social structure that is available in, um, there. It's a, total, it's a total women's space. Now this women's space is, is actually hurtling, uh, is clashing, is working with, is trying to negotiate those spaces, is trying to get into those spaces. And for a long while, he didn't think that those spaces were there for them. But um, our, we tried to instill the idea of, um, of women and political participation, women coming to the Gram Sabhas, working the Gram Sabhas, women getting into development space, making demands, um, uh, claiming their rights in that, in that local governance space. Because that's a local, the local governance space is very fluid. It's, it's, a, it's not, unlike the state and central areas which are extremely fossilized, you can hardly change anything there. The, the local governance space is fluid, it's happening. If, if only we knew how to work it. So that was the space that we tried to work on. And, and when we um, worked with these women and the women started claiming their spaces, when they um, started trying to move into the political structures themselves, coming into governance, the, the natural response from the leadership, which was again male, because we are not talking only about the leadership of the panjayat, but also the political leadership of the party systems, which was again uh, very male. So that resistance was almost total. They needed these women because they were threatened. Because it's, it's 
when you talk of gender parity, when you, it, it's uh, power equations and setting right power relationships is about somebody giving something, giving up something so that somebody else can c claim what is uh, lawfully or legally theirs, um, rightly theirs. And when that space, naturally, anybody, uh, everybody would be resistant, resistance, uh, um, resistant to giving out or, or giving away privileges, powers, authority that they, they already um, are in a position to enjoy, whether rightly or wrong. So how do you deal with that? If women would, be, um, you would have all kinds of um, stories of uh, um, stories of women's character, women's character being uh, called into question, women's physical capabilities being uh, called into question, misappropriation, corruption being thrown on them, and so it will. It, it's, it's getting to be extremely difficult to manage. Um, we tried, however, to work with the higher level of policy making. So. Uh, the, the whole business of working with Kudumbastri was a was excruciating, exhilarating roller coaster of a ride. But it was a ride on how this narrative could actually be worked uh, in the field. So when you found that the local bosses were, uh, were against this, we worked with the higher level. And the higher level, the moment you got the uh, you gained credence and credibility with uh, with the political leadership at the state level. And how do you do that? Because you tell them that, it, that it's politically viable to, you know, that these women are turning into an electorate and you want this electorate to be with you. So that kind of discussion, nego, uh, discussions at the highest policy level and, and winning over the political elite immediately sees down the system a response which is very encouraging. Because then they say, then people immediately you find that they change their, their positions to say, okay, now I can't afford to confront these women because my political bosses are, are uh, keeping tabs on me. So I need now to uh, be able to engage with them. I need to be able to extract the best that I can politically out of them. So then you use the women um, as political agents. You use the women as development agents. And you find that you can push your development agenda. You have a huge organization of empowered, uh, articulate women ready to go and ready to do things, and you find that that is actually pushing your development agenda in, in, the, in, the, in the villages. Now, to do all of this, there needs to be, uh, th th there's a uh, bit of work that needs to be done. One, for instance, if there's money, then it's easy. The, the uh, Narega program, sorry, yeah, uh, yeah, which is why I wanted that clock to work, but it's been off for the past. <laughs> <laughs> right. So anyway, I'll just um, uh, conclude with how, you know, when, uh, what are the things by which you can push a narrative uh, uh, of getting men to engage or, or understand and appreciate women's spaces? One is, of course, the attraction, the lure of money and funds. The Narega program in Kerala, which is a 90% women's program for multiple reasons which I won't go into, because of the fact that the panjayats wanted that money, they were then, they started engaging with the issues of women working in Narega. So you would find panjayat, male panjayat presidents actually advocating for creches and advocating for women-friendly hours of work. Um, if there is visibility, high visibility, you know, when it becomes sexy to be a panjayat president or uh, a panchayat committee that has uh, uh, helped women out and you get uh, publicity, you get uh, fated, then that's good. That's good business. That's good for business and that makes people in, uh, interested. You, so you bring them in for whatever reason into, into the area of women and working with women and you will find that over time, they, because they engage with it and because of the fact that many of these people believe in justice, it's just about opening their eyes to understanding justice perhaps a little differently. And that works. It's worked and you find over time that you have created a base of men supporters. Men who realize what it is to be in the minority. You have 800 women and 3 men. You know just what it means. How that woman 
is why that woman is silent is something that you then understand. And so, so these are just some strategies. I would just end by saying that one of the big things, you know, we have 28 lakh, 2.8 million um, elected representatives in the country whom we are, um, whom we are engaging with. Imagine if we were able to bring, in, bring home the idea of gender equity to them. What would be the status of the country? Thank you. Thanks, Sharda, for ending on the positive note. Uh, and, uh, uh, because I think there have been some particular questions which have been thrown uh, in this um, some, uh, session. And we'll just go to the, I wish I was there actually, rather than sitting in this chair. But um, I'm just open for the question. Now, we just have 10 minutes. Yeah. No, actually there. We visited last there. Thank you. I, I represent the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And as a representative of an international organization, I would like to particularly stress that, yes, governmental um, bureaucracies, they tend to be reluctant to change, to making commitments, and then acting on those commitments. And I think in, in, the, uh, in the theme of this panel, of this discussion, I think it's actually very important to stress that the best results may be achieved when there is linkage between governmental agencies, between the civil society activists, and most people in this room, I understand, are civil society activists, and the international organizations. And utilizing the strengths of each of these three partners, uh, this is how we are going to achieve any real change in the future, uh, because for example, when we talk about the governments, they have the country's resources at their disposal. No one else can actually use the country's public funds but the government. When we talk about the civil society organizations, these are the really proactive, very dynamic, and very driven, self-motivated people who are there to make the change, and they are committed to it. And the international organizations usually have the benefit of having internationally recognized standards, which should be used very properly by all the countries, all the stakeholders, and the governments. So by using this linkage, using the best of the resources of each of these three sides, I believe the development agenda can really move forward with uh, pursuing those goals which we can all agree on and to make sure that there is a real progress. So in my opinion, that would be the real, uh, real way, real method, how to progress and how to really achieve those new goals in new development agenda, which should really underline the needs of equality, including gender equality in this case. Thank you. I wanted to respond to the uh, discussion on uh, Beijing UN Women's Conference. What I'm trying to say, the development context has changed over 20 years. Beijing happened after uh, three years of preparatory process with participation of every grassroots organization. The development context was different. Liberalization process had just started. So, you know, like as you very clearly said, there were differences on the floors of Beijing on issues of conflict, ethnic identity, abortion. There were extreme Islamic positions, extreme Catholic positions. Now, the agenda, the development, uh, development agenda is uh, decided by transnational corporations, multinational corporations. It's not, so need, it's not only the countries. So what we as development organizations can do is, is very limited, very limited. And who's talking about feminist politics now? That is the basic question. And what is their funding situation now? So these are the very crucial questions we need to address. What kind of money is available to organizations which, which is talking about feminist politics? Now, uh, larger organizations, international INGOs who does not have grassroots base, go do the project. It's, they are not going to stay there. Do deliver and run. 
that is the context of feminist politics we have to understand all these issues and um somewhere i feel the mdg process has stalled has stolen the politics of baby the politics of platform for action i am sure many of you have been here who have attended cairo and beijing would understand what i am trying to say it's not indicators and development will not give the uh, development is not a solution to women's vulnerability and it will not reduce violence definitely no just because you are more educated you are employed of course it it opens certain doors but it doesn't re really reduce the risk of violence that's what i was trying to say thank you Very very. Thank you. It's open Pandora's box, and I think many of us would like to respond. But yeah, please. <laughs> Mike. Yeah, thanks. My name is Ben Saunders from South Africa. Um, I just wanted to echo what what was just said and uh, what was touched on in quite a powerful speech um, about how it's it's you know it's. It's across the world where gender violence and gender inequality is happening. Now, I think what, what's, what I've seen through most of this conference is people have been speaking about working with poor and marginalized communities. We do the same thing in, in South Africa where I work. But you know, perhaps it's time to stop pretending that it's only the poor and the marginalized that we need to work with. You know, in countries like Finland and Europe, we've got huge problems with gender-based violence and gender inequality. And maybe we're working with the wrong people sometimes. Campaigns are being run with poor communities, as if as if these people are deficient, and we need to educate them. Which, in some ways, some people have implied is racist, patronising, condescending to those communities. Uh, the other day, they told us that 85 people control as much wealth as 350 million people. 84 of the 85 are men. Who's working with those 84 men? If the CEO of Coca-Cola becomes aware of gender inequality and changes a staffing policy that affects a huge multinational corporation. Surely that's more valuable, or surely that's just as valuable as working with a poor community. So I think, I think the question is, are we actually reinforcing the problem we're trying to solve here by only working with poor and marginalized communities? And are we actually labeling, you know, ironically, some of these communities as deficient by working with them and pretending that we have the solutions for them, when if you actually look at it, do we really have the solutions for them? Thanks. not a question that's just my observation because i'm sorry if i'm not being articulated enough but i just wanted to because ma'am is from the panchayati raj ministry and i wanted to really have your insights on because we know that there was 73rd amendment of where uh, we had like uh, two child norm uh, in Yeah, it's a reservation, but uh, because I, we worked uh, in particularly in Madhya Pradesh area, and uh, when we talk about like giving the choices, like the basket of choices for a woman and controlling her body, so at the same time uh, there are so many uh, restrictions because that uh, that reservation has lot of uh, effects on women's uh, so-called her rights and all because she had to probably like you know not. She was not. Uh, she couldn't. She couldn't be on the election as per se because that after 26 January 2001 she had restricted herself. But at the same time, because we control her fertility in a way that she cannot go for probably more than two years. But at the same time, the government of India or probably like under the family planning, we give her a lot of choices also to go for the other options such as assisted reproductive technologies. So I was just generally concerned about that how we target. Uh, women and as per se their bodies so for like fertility control and at the same time we give the choices for the reproduction so uh, if if you could just give your insights on that what were your experiences so that is yeah. just quickly respond uh, the two child norm is not universal you know, certain states have imposed it some states have imposed it and have withdrawn as well. But Madhya Pradesh, I think, and perhaps Rajasthan, I'm not sure, uh, um, continue with the two-child norm. Uh, the, the ministry is certainly not in, in, in favor of the two-child norm. Um, however, Panjayat Raj is a state subject, so it's up to the state.
to decide uh, its conditionalities. So there is a point beyond which we can't intervene with the state. The only way to do it would be to, to engage with political leadership and, and convince them that they need to change the law. Um, we are very clear, uh, actually, that, that um, Panjait Raj and the space for elected women is not the place to, to be playing uh, you know, fertility games. I mean, that's not where we, that's not where we should be. My question was primarily, I didn't get your name, sir, but uh, you talked about this backlash. You kept emphasizing it and the fact that it's been witnessed in, in Scandinavian nations, which are looked upon as being very progressive. Maybe you could explain to us what are some of the reasons why this is taking place in the more educated community. I mean, in India, of course, we have a strong set of patriarchal norms that continue to prevail. In, in several areas, but what is the reason for it in, in, in these nations? Honestly, we, we don't know. That's, that's precisely the, the, the challenge, is to understand that, you know, we, many times we're working under some paradigm saying, okay, if you do this, the result will be that. No, if you educate women, they will, of course, there are some, some um, interventions we know that lead to a better, you know, uh, status, uh, etc. But the, the most shocking and surprising thing is precisely that, that, you know, the, 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 the recent um, information and reports, studies, are showing that, you know, that these paradigms or these uh, assumptions are not working as, as expected. And that's why, to me at least, it would be very interesting in, though, in these settings where we don't usually conduct research or we, because are not um, as part of the problem, let's say, we could really uh, 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 draw lessons learned that could be also uh, uh, applied to other, to other, you know, contexts. But at the same time, that could challenge our conceptual and uh, operational approaches when, when trying to better understand and also to respond. Thank you. Uh, actually, I was expecting, but I, uh, you know, some of you have spoken about it. I think, I mean, uh, most of this whole area of the developmental and the concerns of the private and public sector, in the sense of the government and also the INGOs and the NGOs and many of the women activists and there's a whole women's movement and the other movement, social movement, that whole gamma I mean, that's a whole. But the whole issue of the development center, I think the most of the spaces which are male-centric and the male controlling the processes and structures, I mean, what are the ways, I think, how we are going to break it? I mean, I think that's one of the things I think we need to, uh, we have to, I think, really actually reconceptualize it, might maybe find out a ways. I mean, one of the things was Sharda shared, but I also know a lot of pressure which are there on the Kudum Shri to close it down. I mean, political, huge pressure, I think, which is Kudum Shri is facing in terms of, so there's a whole issue of the political allocation, the financial allocation, who is funding what, who is changing, you know, all these issues, I think, which are a pertinent questions, and I think these are the larger questions. How do we get those into the development? Then the whole issue of, I think, then the whole developmental sector we need to actually not really address, which I really feel, if, uh, which comes to the whole issue of, I think, what, because we always thought in South, okay, you give the money, you get the autonomous, and there, okay, there we are going to stop the patriarchy and we stop that uh, race. But now what we are talking about and where we thought the Finland and Sweden, the Scandinavian countries, which were proud of their, I mean, the, have achieved the human development index, and we are talking about the domestic violence and the violence coming back and that backlash. So somewhere there's some major issue. So I think, I, I mean, I mean, what are those issues? Are we going to go, ever going to talk again about the whole issue of the division of labor within the men and women and the gender equality and their role? 
what about the development sector when are we going to go beyond activities to look at the structures and the processes which are under those activities when we are designing the programs i think these are the i think few questions which we still need to explore and collectively move towards it towards the gender equality thanks a lot and thanks a lot to the panel and audience